fall camp has started, should we be more optimistic about this outside wide receiver problem with guys like Cordell Russell and DJ Allen emerging, at least in practice one? Uh, also, realignment's going crazy. We'll recap that. But first, we're going to overreact to the first practice of the TCU football season. We'll do that next on Locked on Hard Frogs. You are Locked on Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, welcome into Locked On Horn Frogs. I am your host, Stephen Simcox. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, find us wherever it is you get your podcast in its audio form. And we are rolling along here as TCU has officially opened fall camp. We have started practice. A new football season is here. We got preseason football in the NFL tonight. And in that first practice, you know, we talked a lot about biggest question marks for this team. And in my mind, one of them is I, I think on the inside wide receiver position, this team is pretty set. JoJo Earl, um, John Paul Richardson, Major Everhart, maybe Jack Besh, depending on how they use the LSU transfer as he comes over. Um, but also, on the outside, you got Savion Williams, who was <clears throat> really more of a number two guy last year. Had a nice year, um, has a big frame, is one of those guys that can go up and get jump balls. So he'll be back. Um, you're bringing in Dalen Wright from Minnesota, who is not currently at camp yet. He's still working on um, some. Uh, Jeremy Clark is, is reporting that he's working on some academic stuff from Minnesota, trying to finish up some classes, get ready to be at fall camp. Uh, but he's not there yet. And so he's not in. <clears throat> Savion is having a bigger role. And so you wonder behind those guys, who is going to step up and have a big season? And at least from the first practice of the year, one guy that really impressed was Cordell Russell. And that's the name we've mentioned. And Cordell was super talented coming out of high school. Um, we talked about recruiting the other day and sort of like, is TCU getting talented enough players? Um, because lately they've been getting commits from guys who we would consider more of like high ceiling players, three stars, even one guy in Wesley Harvey's case, who's not really currently ranked by some services, but they feel like, <clears throat> you know, they've scouted them. I think they have a lot of potential, but Cordell Russell is a, a certified blue chip player coming out of high school. I mean, he was a four star according to two, four, seven. Um, my, my buddy, Alex Frank, who has been on the show before he pointed out yesterday that. Some services had him even higher. It's like a five-star player. I mean, this was a really legit talent coming out of high school uh, from North Mesquite. And I, I thought he could be a, a contributor for this team. <clears throat> but my biggest question was, he had a broken collarbone during the spring, so he wasn't able to go through spring practice. And so you just wonder, like, all right, is he going to be ready to come in and contribute immediately? Um, now, wide receiver is one of those positions that the transition seems easier than, you know, say offense and defensive line where there's a level of physicality and, and size that usually you have to develop and grow to before you can hit the field. But we saw last season um, Jordan Hudson was a super talented guy coming out of high school, and now Jordan's at SMU. Uh, and he ended up being a contributor. I mean, he was a, a guy that started, he played, he had a catch in that playoff game, um, had some catches in the Big 12 title game. But – you know, his numbers were <clears throat> pretty modest for the entire season. However, Russell was really impressive in camp yesterday. Uh, Steven Johnson from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram commented that Russell uh, beat a defender for a touchdown in seven-on-seven seven, um, and made some big plays. Sonny Dykes said that he anticipates uh, – Sonny Dykes said this in press conference after practice. He anticipates – that Cordell Russell will compete for playing time this season. And he said he made more plays today than other younger receivers in the past. Um, so exciting stuff. And Johnson, I want to say one more note about Russell. Sonny Dyke said sometimes highly recruited guys like being recruited more than playing football. Not the case with Russell, who Dyke said likes to practice and play the game. And you could see that passion today. So steps in as a true freshman, first real practice, <clears throat> and makes things happen and makes plays. And this would be a big development if Cordell – I'm not expecting him to come in and start day one, but if he can be a reliable target for them and someone who can go up and get the football or make big plays for them, 
as a true freshman, um, then that takes pressure off some of these other players, some other wide receivers that were impressive in that first practice. And this is the guy that honestly, I think like I personally sort of forgot about, and I should have mentioned him more during the off season when we were discussing potential options, but DJ Allen from Gladewater, who was another four-star talent that was in the class of 2022. Um, and was highly recruited guy. TCU fought with Florida pretty hard to get him. And, Allen had an impressive day. Um, Steven Johnson said he had a nice contested catch from Chandler Morris on day one of practice. Now, Allen's a little more undersized. He's 5'11", 190, um, whereas Russell's standing at 6'2". And so I'm not sure what the plan for him will be, if he'll be you know, more at the outside spot or if he's somebody that slide inside. But one thing about this team, now, it's, it's sort of like last year's receiver group in that we talked last season about we thought that receiver group could be really good, but you were banking a lot more potential than production. And it's somewhat similar this year. Now you have some proven guys. I would say like Savion Williams and John Paul Richardson are players that fall in the proven guy category. Um, and you have some dudes. And I, I mean, Jack Besh, honestly, too. He had a really good freshman season. Um, JoJo Earl is high ceiling, high potential player, you know, Super highly recruited guy, goes to Alabama, contributed some for them, ends up at TCU. Uh, so that's another name to watch. But you have a lot of players who you're sort of like, okay, well, if this guy can you know, understand the offense well, stay healthy, get opportunities, then I think they have the chance to have a big season. And, I mean, when you go down the list, there's a lot of playmakers here. Now, they have to do it on the field. They have to prove it. But Chandler Morris has, has a lot of weapons. I mean, at tight end position, you got Jerry Wiley, you got Dan Jerry Rogers, um, Savion Williams, Daylon Wright, you know, Cordell Russell, DJ Allen, Major Everhart, JoJo Earl, John Paul Richardson, Jack Besh. That's a lot of names to get the football to. And listen, like it's it's peak offseason time now. And so all these guys that we name aren't necessarily going to be getting 50 to 60 targets this season, right? But there's there's some depth there. Now, again, a lot of it's based on potential and not, you know, past production at the college level, but it's still a huge deal. Um, some other notes from practice that went down. Watched some of Sunny Dykes' press conference, and uh, he said one of the battles he's really excited about this season is going to be the defensive line. Sonny seems higher on this defensive line than like fans and, and the media do. And I don't know if he's just trying to get those guys confidence or if he really sees some, um, you know, physical traits and ability that, that we're just not seeing in practice. Um, but he said at media days that he thinks they're 10 deep, which I was like, okay, that's, that is, um, that's more depth at that position than I would have thought. And then, Yesterday, he just kind of said he's really excited to see who emerges. There's a lot of opportunity there, right? You're going to have, he said, the top three and then the top six because D-line is going to rotate a lot. So who are the guys that um, emerge and really push to be on the field? And that excitement might just drive from that's one of the positions that's very uncertain on the team. And so he's just um, excited for the opportunity for these players to show like, okay, Who's going to pop? Who's going to be the guy that forces us to sit down and say, okay, yes, we have to get that guy on the football field. But it definitely feels like Sonny Dykes has an excitement and optimism about that position group that maybe some of us don't. And hopefully he's right about that. It kind of reminds me of the way he talked about the O-line last season. You know, the the O-line had really struggled the last few years, but Sonny felt like they were a physical football team up front. And they can make that work. He also talked about the running back position, and I might have to give an apology to Tanner McKinney. He's been telling me for months, like, I think Cam Cook's a dude. I think that's going to be a guy that uh, steps up right away and is a player. And I was constantly kind of like, okay, tap the brakes. You know, I think it's going to be tough for him to come in and contribute. But um, he, he mentioned Cam Cook yesterday as a force along with Trey Sanders uh, and um, Amani Bailey. So a lot of different options for TCU. Again, yes, is it mainly about um, potential rather than production? It is. But I like the way this is going. And I also want to see where this O-line kind of sits 
as as the year goes on. But um, exciting times for TCU football right now as practice has started. And if Cordell Russell and DJ Allen can truly emerge as players at that outside wide receiver spot, um, then <clears throat> we're talking about big time, big time players. Uh, one more thing before we go to break. So um, Sonny also said that he thinks Thomas Armstrong and Marcel Brooks could help them with a pass rush. And I've discussed um, what Marcel Brooks could be and what he could do. Here's something that I, I, I kind of finally put together yesterday. And I'm not comparing him to this guy necessarily. Well, I guess I am. But um, so Marcel Brooks plays the star linebacker position, which in this defense last year was held by D. Winters. And the star linebacker is asked to do a lot. He's asked to play in coverage, also, um, you know, handle responsibilities at the line of scrimmage. Now, D was kind of interesting because he looked like a linebacker. I mean, his body type and the way he was built, he looked more like a prototypical inside linebacker, but he was also super athletic. And Brooks was in a red jersey yesterday, so he's not full go yet. However, um, Marcel is super long and rangy and athletic, and it reminded me of Dave Aranda runs a 3-3-5 at Baylor. Um, he had Jalen Petrie in a similar position his first couple years at Baylor. And there's, I'm sure there's a lot of minutia and like nuance to what Dave Aranda does on defense as opposed to what Joe Gillespie does. But if you watch that Baylor defense, especially that year that they won the Big 12 championship, Petrie was all over the field. And he wasn't built like a linebacker. I mean, he's built more like a safety. Um, and he was recruited by Matt Rule. And the first few years of his career, he was on the field because, like, he didn't have a clear position. But they found a spot for him in this 3-3-5 scheme. And he was just kind of everywhere for the Bears. And now he's playing safety at Houston. And I'm wondering if Marcel Brooks could be a similar type of player. I don't think he's going to get the snap count that Petrie did at Baylor last year because he was the dude on that defense. But – just the versatility and the ability to kind of play at all three levels um, is really fascinating. And there's not many other players on this team that I can think of that kind of has that athleticism and ability. So that's just kind of one more note to sit on as we get towards, uh, as we get closer to football season. Coming up next, realignment continues to go crazy. And so we'll give you the latest update on that in a minute. It's Lockdown Horn Frogs. I do want to talk about LinkedIn College for a second, though, or excuse me, LinkedIn.com. The website is LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College, and you can go there and you can post your job for free. If you're hiring, you know, like you have to acquire talent. You have to find the right people, not only talented people, but the people that fit your job, right? Good culture fits, folks that are going to get along with your current workers. Um, and so LinkedIn is the place to go. Everybody knows LinkedIn. It's the biggest, you know, name in the hiring game. It's where people go to look for work. So you want to use LinkedIn because there's a huge network of people that you can choose from. And then you can use some of their tools like simple screening questions to hone in on exactly who you need to talk to uh, to move forward. LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. You can post your job for free. They have a purple hiring frame that you can put your job in. Um, it's the best place to go because, again, you know, there's a ton of people that use LinkedIn to find work. You can find ways to narrow down your search and save your time, which I know when it comes to hiring, that's what you want to do. You don't want to waste time. You want to find the right people that fit your business. If you're a small business owner, you should use them. LinkedIn is number one when it comes to small business owners. This is who they use to find talent. LinkedIn.com slash college. In this LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. Post that job for free. They are a proud sponsor of the Lockdown Network. So I didn't intend for uh, our show to become so heavy into realignment, but there's just news every day, and I'm talking about it. Feel free, like, if you want to comment, if you're not feeling the realignment talk on a day-in and day-out basis, that's totally cool. You can tell me, and I'll consider backing off of it. Um, but I, I just think it's it's super interesting uh, what's happening with the Pac-12 and the Big 12, and now potentially uh, the Big Ten and ACC, according to reports, as there continues to just be things happening um, all the time. But one question that I got asked yesterday, uh, Jacob Langford asked me this in the YouTube comments. He said, I was reading how the Arizona Board of Regents 
governs both Arizona and Arizona State, would they really let them be in different conferences? I keep seeing Arizona, but not Arizona State, so I just wonder how that would work. Either way, it's quite fascinating. Yes, Jacob, you are right. Um, the Arizona Board of Regents, they govern both Arizona and Arizona State, and so they're making decisions for both those schools. Now, these schools can operate independently, but it's the same board that is making these choices. Uh, and so for a long time, Arizona State has not really been involved in these Big 12 discussions because they seem pretty um, they, they seem pretty loyal to the Pac-12. Their athletic director, Ray Anderson, has said many times that they're committed to the Pac-12. They seemed happy with staying you know, on the West Coast in that conference with their partners. Apparently that has changed pretty dramatically in the last 24 hours. Um, Jason Shear, who I've discussed lately, he's been he's done a really good job reporting on these subjects. Um, he works for Wildcat Authority, which is part of the 247 network and covers the Arizona Wildcats. He is reporting that Arizona and Arizona State and Utah are aligned and they are potentially ready to make a move to the Big 12 together. Now, Arizona has been you know, heading this direction for a long time. They are a school along with Colorado that we have heard about for really the past calendar year as a potential member of the Big 12 Conference. Um, but it, it hasn't all come together. Uh, they seemed like they were ready to make the jump after this meeting that happened earlier this week where George Glykoff reportedly presented a media rights deal to the Pac-12 members, but it was uh, – heavy on the streaming side pretty much all the games are gonna be on apple tv and it was at its base level between 20 and 22 million dollars and then there was room for incentives based on how many subscriptions um, apple got specifically for pac-12 content so uh, that deal was not looked upon fondly uh, apparently by the presidents and so now um, there's a scramble happening and it appears that along with arizona which we have we have long seen that Arizona has been a school that is interested in moving to the Pac-12. Um, but along with Arizona, we could see now Arizona State and um, Utah move over to the move over to the Big 12, which would give uh, the Big 12 16 teams, which there's been speculation now for a few days that 16 is kind of the cap that the Big 12 wants to sit at. So I don't know what the next move would be. I mean, Oregon and Washington are kind of still sitting out there. Um, and, you know, nobody knows if they're going to stay in the Pac-12, if they're going to move to the Big 12. They appear to want to move to the Big 10. Another aspect of this is the Big 10, uh, apparently as early as today, will meet and start exploring expansion again. So the Big 10 for – a while now, their line has been publicly and it appears privately. The line they've given everybody has been, hey, we're not super interested in expanding. We like what we've done by adding USC and UCLA. We're going to sit tight for a while. But now the Big Ten is meeting again and talking about, OK, what do expansion candidates look like? They're discussing um, Oregon, Washington, potentially even Stanford and Cal, which are two really good academic institutions. And Stanford has a good history in athletics, the football team has struggled lately. Um, it, it, so there's all kinds of tentacles to this. But from a Big 12 perspective, <clears throat> it appears Arizona is on the move. In fact, there is an executive session um, by the Arizona Executive Board that has been called to order for Thursday evening. And one of the items on the agenda is possible legal advice and discussion regarding university athletics. So it is um, – widely believed <clears throat> that Arizona will make an announcement on Thursday night that they will be moving to the Big 12. I don't know if we'll get an announcement about Arizona State that quickly because usually these things take time. There's a lot of things that have to be ironed out. So I would be surprised if we got clarity on both Arizona and Arizona State as early as Friday, but we could. And Utah has also been very, um, you know, feet in the sand, like they have stood their ground. They want to stay in the Pac-12, but supposedly that's changed. According to reports from Jason Shear in the past, really in the past like 24 hours, that's changed a lot. So I think getting numbers from George Glykoff that were not satisfactory has really turned this on its head. Um, Florida State also had a board meeting yesterday where they talked about 
the, the ACC's revenue, and the ACC is locked into a TV deal until 2036. They don't like the amount of money that they're getting, <clears throat> and so they're exploring options to possibly leave. <clears throat> I'm not sure where they would go if they decide to make a move, but it is wild times in college sports. And, I mean, there have been different times. The Big 12 really twice has gone through the scenario where everyone has said, okay, this is the end of the Big 12, right? It happened when Texas threatened to leave and then ended up staying. And then it happened when Texas and OU left. Um, and they've stayed together. And I've I've really felt like even as dire as it looked for the Pac-12 this past, you know, year-long saga that's been going on, I thought that they would salvage something. Like, I thought there would be teams that would leave, but I felt like at the end of the day when the dust settled, there would be still some version of the Pac-12. And today I'm not sure that's the case. Like, maybe there is. Maybe they just kind of absorb the Mountain West and create that into the new Pac-12 with the few leftovers that are there. But if the four corner schools, I mean, Colorado's already made the move, and then if Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah all decide they're leaving, um, and if Oregon and Washington move on, I mean, who's left? You're, you're talking about Stanford, Cal, Washington State, Oregon State. Would those schools stay together and take in a number of group of five teams to try to create a new conference? Would they get absorbed elsewhere? Um, it's a wild time in college sports. We we are closer than ever to what has been predicted for a long time, um, but – I didn't, I didn't know it would come together this quickly, which is, you know, three or four super conferences. That's what we're, we're moving towards. And eventually, maybe just a complete break from the NCAA and a new world of college football. That is, I mean, it's already, in a lot of ways, a professional sport. But this would be a brand new frontier um, for the sport if they went to, you know, <clears throat> 20 team conferences, potentially. So, I don't know where this all ends, but uh, if those three schools do jump and you have a 16-team Big 12, that's that's a lot of teams. And I, I would love to see how they um, would schedule. You know, do they go to pods? Do they go to um, different divisions? Like, how do they find a way to keep these games somewhat regional uh, in a sport that's supposed to be regional but has become very much a national sport? Uh, in the last few seasons. When we come back, the Iowa State quarterback, Hunter Deckers, is um, in some trouble. And so we'll talk about the next and what that means for TCU uh, here on Locked on Hard Frogs. <clears throat> Iowa State quarterback, Hunter Deckers, is under investigation. He's under investigation from the NCAA. He's also in legal trouble for tampering with evidence. And what Deckers is accused of um, legally, he's accused for ta with tampering with records, um, but he tampered with records to cover up alleged sports gambling while he was an athlete at Iowa State. Apparently, Hunter um, used the DraftKings sportsbook platform to place these bets. DraftKings is legal in Iowa, and then also it's illegal for student athletes to bet on sports. And um, Hunter made a lot of bets. Uh, that totaled more than uh, almost three thousand dollars. He made three hundred and sixty-six bets online, uh, and he made one bet on the twenty twenty-one Iowa State Oklahoma State football game um, when he was a backup quarterback at Iowa State. And so Deckers is facing some pretty harsh penalties from the NCAA. He could lose his college eligibility, and this has been. Rumored for a while. I mean, there's a lot of athletes um, that have supposedly gotten caught up in this. Iowa and Iowa State, both schools have been investigated pretty thoroughly over the past few months. Um, but Deckers quietly was really good last season. I mean, Iowa State was not good, but he threw for over 3,500 yards. Um, and there was excitement that in another year at Iowa State, with experience under his belt, um, he could be – a big time player this season and one of the better quarterbacks in the big 12. Um, according to an attorney that's representing Deckers, he will not participate in fall camp as this investigation goes on. And so from a TCU standpoint, this is one of their opponents this upcoming season. They play Iowa state on the road in Ames and it's, it's part of that seven game stretch 
to start the season where you feel like TCU is probably going to be favored in most of those games, Colorado, Nickel State, Houston, SMU, West Virginia, Iowa State, BYU, and then you get into the Kansas State, Texas Tech, Texas, Baylor, Oklahoma gauntlet. But that game on the road in Ames on October 7th, um, it looked tricky. That's a tough place to play. It's probably going to be cold. Weather's not going to be great. Uh, Iowa State, you would you would think is going to be better this year under Matt Campbell. But now there's huge questions about that because Deckers is uh, supposedly, you know, could not play. Um, Rocco Beck, who's a redshirt freshman, will be competing for the uh, starting job along with true freshman J.J. Cole. So now you're talking about two guys that are competing for that starting quarterback job at Iowa State who have not played in the past. And that is a huge difference than Hunter Deckers who had, you know, 12 starts last season and had a really impressive season from a stats perspective. Um, so just something to note, Iowa State's quarterback in trouble, investigated for potential sports gambling, alleged sports gambling, also in some legal trouble, and will not participate in fall camp, could lose his college eligibility. I uh, did some – I made some comments about TCU's recruiting and sort of where they're at uh, in yesterday's episode, and some of you commented. And so I was going to read um, some of those. David May said consistency is the key. Keep playing for titles, and that will get the attention of recruits. It seems like four-star kids would rather ride the bench at Texas than come to smaller schools. There, are, there should also be a cap in NIL money. That's eventually what needs to happen. It's what sports teams had, to, pro sports teams had to do. Um, yeah, David, I mean, I think this year's going to be huge for TCU from a recruiting standpoint. Have to continue this success to show recruits um, that, you know, you're serious and that you're not just a one-hit wonder, and, and that's going to help TCU. And we'll see what happens with NIL. I, I agree with you. I think there needs to be a cap, but at the same time, like, then you're talking about, are our guys going to unionize? Are you going to have a collective bargaining agreement? There's a lot of different issues that arise when you do that. Um, DW Cardell said, Johnny Manziel is a three star. Breeze was a three star. The list goes on forever. Uh, yeah. And I mean, you can like, you can look individually at players and five, there are five stars that wash out there. Three star players end up being great players. Now, I think from a team perspective, um, there's pretty empirical research that shows that you need to be a team that recruits in the top 10 in the country, top five in the country on a consistent basis to win a national championship. TCU so tried to buck that trend last season, couldn't quite do it. Um, however, your point is taken. In individual cases, it, it doesn't always make a difference. And my, my point was more like, let's not disparage these kids that are committing because obviously the coaching staff sees something in them. And, you know, it's a big deal for them that they are uh, part of the team. Um, and Craig said the star system has a place. It's a method of evaluating players. However, like any evaluation system, um, who and how it's done has a huge influence. Some evaluators are better at the job than others uh, and went on to make some other good points. And you're right, Craig. I mean, like it is about who's evaluating. And we'll say I think these industry services have gotten a lot better in the past 10 years or so. And now there's so many camps and just – ability to see players um, that you see less under the radar talents. But I think that's one reason why TCU is doing these camps is to find guys that are under the radar. And I feel like they're doing a good job of finding those players. And so hopefully they can continue to do that as well as attract the attention of more, you know, highly talented blue chip guys that have higher ratings. And so we'll be back tomorrow to finish out the week. It's been fun having football back. Uh, thanks for joining in today. It's Lockdown Horn Frogs, your team every day.